Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this special program for the next hour. My name is John McDonough. I'm a professor of practice at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health in Boston. And this program is put together by the International Collaborative on Costs, Needs, and Outcomes in Care, otherwise known as ICONIC. Uh, it's a collaboration of the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and the London School of Economics and Political Science. And the two leaders of that collaborative have done work today that they will be presenting to you over the next half hour. And then we will be following it up with a discussion involving uh, David Blumenthal, president of the Commonwealth Fund, and Jennifer Dixon, chief executive of the Health Foundation. So let's uh, get started. Our two presenters and the uh, folks who did this research that we're presenting to you this afternoon include uh, Dr. Jose Figueroa, who's an assistant professor in health policy and management at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and associate professor at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And he is uh, joined by uh, Dr. Irene Papanicolas, an associate professor of health economics at the Department of Health Policy at the London School of Economics and a visiting society, scientist at the Harvard Chan School. Uh, and she's also co-director of ICONIC. Uh, their topic is international comparisons of high need patient care trajectories. Um, it's a familiar process to those who pay close attention to the Commonwealth Fund and it's compelling series over 20 years of cross national comparisons. You'll see some resemblances and some differences. And uh, with that, I will turn the program over to Dr. Figueroa and Dr. Papa Nicholas to take it from here. Thank you, John. Um, thank you all for joining us today where we're excited to share some results and insights from the ICONIC project. So the ICONIC project, as John said, is an international comparison of high need patients care trajectories over 11 high income countries. So the main research question that the ICONIC project asks is what can countries learn from one another to improve care for the most complex and costliest patient populations? In order to do this work uh, with funding from the Commonwealth Fund and the Health Foundation, a group of researchers from 11 countries and the OECD formed the ICONIC Research Collaborative in 2018. The aim was to go beyond aggregated population health data that's publicly available to see if we could use individual level data for patients linked across care settings to try to identify the same type of patient in different countries and follow them over the course of a year to see how they made different utilization of care and what this cost the system. The key objectives of the project were three. First, Using the existing data sources that we had available for research, were we able to identify comparable high need patient personas, and by that I mean similar types of patients across countries. Second, were we able to follow these patients over the course of the year and determine if they had meaningful differences in terms of the utilization of care they consumed across different care settings, spending for this care, and as a third objective, differences in any patient outcomes of interest. So what do we mean when we talk about high need, high cost patient personas? So here we started off with a framework published by the National Academy of Medicine that looks at the top 10% of expenditures and, and the types of patients that account for those expenditures. These are not a homogeneous group. Uh, instead, this framework breaks them apart into different classifications of patients who are more likely to have similar patterns of care use. We took two of these priority populations as they're called in the framework and tried to think of how we could attach data to them so that they would easily be identifiable in claims data. The two priority populations that we chose to focus on were an older person with frailty and a person with complex multimorbidity. The way we chose to identify personas or, or identify them in the, in, the, in the registry data was to look at something like a clinical vignette where we could define specific age bands and conditions with which we could identify them across each country. 
For the older person with frailty, we looked at a person aged 65 years and older uh, who's admitted to the hospital with a hip fracture and undergoes a subsequent hip replacement or osteosynthesis. Representing a person with complex multimorbidity, we looked at a person aged between 65 and 90 years admitted to the hospital with heart failure and at the time of admission with a comorbidity of diabetes. And then the project idea was once we identify these patients and we believe they're comparable cohorts. So here you have, for example, the older person with a hip fracture. If we look across the 11 countries represented in the study group, what does a year of care look like for these patients? And so by that, I mean, in the initial hospitalization, how long do they spend in the hospital? How many other hospitalizations do they have over the course of the year? How much do all of these hospitalizations cost the system? How many emergency room visits do they have that don't result in a hospitalization? How much post-acute rehabilitative care do they have following the index admission and over the course of the year? And where does this occur? Is it in the hospital, in a facility that's dedicated to rehab, or at home or in the community? How many primary care visits do they have? And when they go to the primary care doctor or clinic, who do they see? Is it a doctor or a nurse? How many outpatient specialty visits do they have? And how much does this cost? And how many pharmaceuticals are they prescribed? And again, what does this cost the system? And of course, what are outcomes for these populations? How much of the cohort is surviving at 30 days and how much of the cohort is surviving at a year? And what are different quality measures that we can look at along the way to determine differences about the provision of care in these different settings? So we'd like to present some key findings. The first is about the data that was available for research. We were able to identify linked individual data across the 11 countries participating in the study. But even though we were looking at 11 data rich countries, we still found there were many important data gaps that need to be addressed for this type of work. So here you can see uh, the different data sets used across the, the research group um, and grouped into differences in the geographical representation of the data, as well as the percentage of the population aged over 65 nationally that's uh, represented in the data set. You can see that there's an, about an equal split in the type of data that we had with uh, about a third of the countries having regional data accessible. This was mostly in systems where there are large regional differences in the health provision uh, at the state or provincial level. We also had a group of countries that had a national sample of the population available. And in here we have both England and the United States represented. And there were a few countries that had a national population data uh, that covered 100% of the population. Um, in the United States, we used the Medicare fee-for-service sample uh, covering about 12% of the over 65 population. And in England, our priority again was to look at linked data across all care settings. So we opted to use the clinical practice research data link. Uh, even though England has 100% representation for inpatient claims, once you link that to uh, primary care data, the representativeness of the entire population goes down. And here we had about 7% represented. If we look at the care domains represented, we had seven care domains that we would have liked to be able to follow patients across. That was inpatient hospital care, post-acute rehab, primary care, outpatient specialty, home health, outpatient drugs, and long-term care. Only four countries were able to follow patients across all of these care settings. The United States was able to follow patients across six of the care settings, uh, not having data on long-term care. England was able to follow patients across four of the care settings, missing data on long-term care, home health, and post-acute rehab care. So now I'd like to pass off to Jose, who will talk to you about some of the other empirical findings from the research. Thank you, Irini. The next key, uh, the next key finding uh, is despite the differences in the country data sets, it was really reassuring that we were able to identify comparable high need patient personas across the countries. So for example, when we look at the complex multimorbid persona, which we defined as a heart failure persona with diabetes, the mean age was roughly about the same across all countries and the percent of patients who were reported as female was also quite similar across countries. 
The same was true for the hip fracture persona where the average age across all countries above, was above age 80 years. And the majority of patients across the countries was disproportionately more likely to be female. For the hip fracture persona, we also compared coding of, the, of where exactly the fracture occurred. Across all countries, the relative coding of where the fracture occurred, whether it be at the head of the femur, at the neck of the femur, or in the trochanteric area, was roughly similar. The relative proportion of the specific procedures performed was also quite similar across countries. And the majority of patients that presented with a hip fracture received either a partial replacement of the hip joint or uh, osteosynthesis pinning. So again, those, that, th those results are reassuring for us as we move forward and start comparing other aspects of health services use and what was paid for it. The key finding number three was comparisons of care trajectories reveal important insights for countries, including evidence of potential substitution across different care settings. For example, we were interested in determining how much time patients spent in some sort of facility, whether it be a hospital or a rehab care facility over the course of the year. And importantly, this means that patients are not at home, which is something everyone cares about. When we compare the average number of days in the hospital, we see that the US patients stayed the fewest number of days in a hospital setting, whereas Germany and England were among the highest with nearly 30 days for both countries across the course of the year. It's important to note though, that in countries like Germany, much of the rehab process functionally occurs in a hospital setting, where that's not necessarily the case of the United States where it occurs predominantly in places like skilled nursing rehab facilities. So when we examined the number of patients among the countries that had accessible data in, spent in rehab facilities, we find that the US goes from looking arguably among the most efficient to the least efficient, where almost 60 days were spent in some sort of facility over the course of the year, and importantly, again, not at home. And there was an inverse correlation with the number of days spent in a hospital versus days in a rehab facility across the countries that had accessible data across both categories. We also compared the number of PCP visits or GP visits uh, for, for people in, in these personas. In the US, we find that, the, the, that the, the number of visits to a PCP was the lowest, whereas in countries like Germany, Spain, and England, there were three to four times more visits per person with a PCP or GP. And in England, the majority of those visits were to nurses and not to MDs, whereas in England, whereas in the United States, it was predominantly all MDs. When we look at uh, visits to MD specialists, we also see variation. This time the US has more visits to specialty, special, specialty MDs on average to other countries, whereas England is slightly below average. We then look at the relative proportion of visits to PCPs versus specialists, and only two countries, the US and Canada, had relatively more visits with specialist MDs over the course of the year than they do with PCPs, which has important implications for total costs at the end of the year. Whereas in England, two thirds of the outpatient visits were to PCPs, GPs, which was the case again for almost all other countries as well. Key finding number four, drivers of high spending differ across countries with the US having the highest prices per unit. For example, costs per hospitalization were highest in the US with over 13,000 spent, while England was the lowest, paid the lowest amount with uh, about a slightly over $7,000 per hospitalization. That's nearly a twofold difference between the two countries. Cost per PCP visit was again highest in the US and in England, care was the cheapest. Cost per specialty visit, the US again, consistently the highest per price paid per unit. Whereas in England, uh, in this case for specialty visit and uh, with a specialty visits, it was slightly below average. When we look at drug utilization and spending, we find that the US and England are on average about average when it comes to the number of unique drugs prescribed. 
with about 15 drugs per person, in this case for the heart failure and diabetes persona, although the pattern is very similar for the hip fracture persona as well. What is paid for those drugs though is quite different. The United States is, is a far and above an outlier for drug spending. And England is on the other end of the spectrum paying the least amount for the same amount of drugs. Key finding number five, there is substantial variability in outcomes across countries and it's not really correlated with total cost. We looked at mortality rates across three different time intervals, in-hospital mortality that occurred during the index hospitalization, 30-day mortality, which could have occurred at home, in the hospital, in a rehab facility, and then uh, one-year mortality from day one of hospitalization. We see here that the US and England are on opposite end of the spectrum with the US among the lowest mortality rate and England among the highest. It's important to note here though, that the US has the lowest length of stay during the index hospitalization and they discharge people to rehab facilities quite quickly. And that could be contributing to this, to this, um, uh, to this rate. Whereas in England, they had the longest stay for the index hospitalization, and so they stay quite long. The other thing in England as well is that there's a lot of patients that die in the hospital uh, beyond 30 days. And so when we look at 30-day mortality, for example, we see England is still the highest mortality rate, but their 30-day mortality rate is slightly lower than their index hospital death rate. And that, again, is because there's a large proportion of patients that are dying in the hospital beyond 30 days. In the United States, they look, again, above average in terms of performance on mortality rate. The story changes, though, when we start looking at rates within a year. We see that the United States becomes among the highest, in, 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 you know, as well as England remaining the highest country with the, the highest mortality rate. And, and this, I think, this is also a finding that these two countries also had really high mortality rates for the other person, or the person with heart failure and diabetes. One thing that could be explaining some of the variation in mortality within, at the shorter time intervals is time to surgery for a hip fracture persona. Across most surgical societies, the recommendation is if someone presents to a hospital with a hip fracture, the recommendation is to operate quickly within 24 to 48 hours. When we look at it across the countries that were able to do this analysis, we see that the England and the United States are actually pretty good at operating at people within 48 hours, uh, with the majority of patients get, getting to an operating uh, bed, uh, to, to the operating room. And so this does not, at least in the case for the English mortality, be seen to play a big role. And so there's probably something else that's behind the high mortality rate. So I will pass it on to Irini here to, for the final comments and conclusion. Thank you, Jose. So as you can see, international comparisons of the care trajectory reveal important differences in care delivery across countries where that happens and potentially some substitution across care settings. For us, this demonstrates the importance of looking at the entire care trajectory. As, as you can see, looking only at one area of care would provide different insights and po potentially misleading ones. Uh, we believe that these results serve as a starting point for policymakers and researchers to ask more targeted questions about how they can improve the care that their health system provides for these complex populations. For example, some questions that emerge for England and the USA are about the efficiency of the post-acute care provision. Is England spending too little on post-acute care? And in the US, are patients spending too much time in post-acute care? This relate rates raises a related question about long-term care systems and their performance, uh, as well as the impact that that might have on utilization of healthcare. Um, so are the long-term care systems in these countries supported enough uh, to support the patient needs um, or are their healthcare systems taking over some of this burden? And finally, we believe that if you want to, to promote integrated care within countries, data needs to be following the patient so that we can look at the care that patients get across the entire care journey and not be siloed across care settings. 
if we really want to promote this type of care and learn how to improve it, we need to promote more data collection and more data linkage uh, so that we're able to follow patients in this way. Before we, we uh, hand over to the discussion, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to our research partners. This work uh, was developed, or I guess these results were developed over years of work uh, with many partners, as you can see from the participating countries and organizations involved. And also thank you to our funders for the support that they gave us. And finally, if you're interested in looking at the results in more detail and reading more about the work, please visit our website, iconic.net. There you can find links to the published articles that came out yesterday in a special issue of Health Services Research, and also more about the project uh, and other uh, links to news articles where it's been featured. Thank you for your time. So thank you, uh, Jose and Irene, for that fantastic study and for the compelling results. And now we're gonna to turn to some experts to get some commentary and some analysis of it. And we have two in particular, and I can't think of two better people to have at this point. Uh, we, we're joined by uh, Dr. David Blumenthal, who's the uh, president of the Commonwealth Fund, uh, the most important foundation that studies the US healthcare system in so many uh, different ways. Previously, he uh, served at Partners Healthcare System as the Samuel Thea Professor of Medicine and Healthcare Policy at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Uh, he also served as National Coordinator for Health Information Technology under President Barack Obama. So David will talk, but before that, we will hear from uh, Dr. Jennifer Dixon, who's the Chief Executive of the uh, Health Foundation Again, a major philanthropy and health foundation in England. Uh, previously, she was chief executive of the Nuffield Trust and also director of policy at the King's Fund. And finally, she served as policy advisor to the chief executive of the National Health Service in England. And so we will first turn it over to uh, Dr. Dixon to tell us how these studies ring true in uh, her context back in England. Thank you very much, John. And uh, the first thing I just want to say is to congratulate the team, Irene and Jose, and that very large team for their patient and painstaking work over so many years, because I'm sure it is, is incredibly frustrating, but you carried it through and you got the fantastic result at the end of the peer review and these, these very interesting results. So well done all. So I just had sort of four initial comments, if I might. Uh, the first on outcomes, I mean, clearly anyone from Britain looking at these figures would be taken and arrested, I think, by the outcomes data, particularly the uh, mortality data for both groups of patients. And, um, you know, what, looking at those data, they're not particularly out of line with some of the data we have internally in Britain. We have audits and for the heart failure and the hip replacement audit, uh, hip fracture audits, the 30 day and one year mortality are not that different. They're slightly lower in the audits, but not that much lower. So I think they do have a kind of valid validity um, and, and we have known about this. So I think that's that's the first question. The, the, then the obvious question is why that is the case. No doubt we'll go on to discuss that a little bit more. Um, I mean, I think in studies like this, you always worry about um, eligibility. Is the sample the same? Do they compare? Is the um, other morbidities? And I think the research team have been incredibly careful in trying to make those kinds of comparisons, um, particularly looking at the morbidities coded. So that, I suspect that probably isn't the major factor which is causing us to be an outlier. Um, when you look at the kind of hospital care, um, I was looking at OECD data, um, you know, patients with a hip fracture, for example, don't suffer more um, DVTs, um, deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary emboli. Um, than other countries comparably. But what, how we do, separate, um, why we are different in, in hip fractures, for example, is that we carry out a far lower rate of hip replacements more generally, whether it's elective or emergency compared to other countries, we are an outlier. So there's a question there about the extent to which we are used to doing these things, whether, whether a higher volume might help with the outcomes. Um, I think, um, I, th I think, the other thing I would 
turn to is our very long length of stay, as you see, and whether or not uh, that is leading to some kind of deconditioning of patients that ultimately uh, means that there are poorer outcomes in the longer run is a question that I would ask. So that's, anyway, there's a whole set of things to do with outcomes that, that we would need to take seriously and look at. So quicker, more quick points on uh, three other points. One is data. I think it's um, a bit disappointing. We've got a national health system with a single payer. Uh, we have really good data, but we can't obviously link it uh, outside of hospitals very well. And in particular, our data on uh, general practice, social care, and particularly post-acute care in the community is murky, can't link it. So we can't really know what's going on so well there. So that's another point of learning. The third area is costs and you know, reference has been made to the low costs relative in, in, in the NHS compared to other countries um, right across the board. Some good like low cost for drugs, but some maybe with mixed um, outcomes such as paying less for hospital care and primary care. So I think um, this, this is also probably um, linked to underinvestment in the National Health Service, on, which is fairly chronic compared to our Western European nations. So there's quite a lot to be said about that. And then the last point I would make is that I think if you set this um, study alongside other very interesting studies, the OECD Health at a Glance, um, for example, that came out yesterday, you can see that um, Britain as a whole, the United Kingdom, um, is does have um, doesn't score uniformly awfully on on our outcomes. Um, actually, we're pretty middle of the pack when it comes to some other outcomes. So we are good and bad in places, I would say, and we are generally improving. So I think that's something for us to hang on to, but to look very seriously at the outcomes that uh, this study has thrown up. Thank you. Thanks for those comments, uh, Dr. Dixon. Much appreciated. So let's. Um turn it over to uh, our friend David Blumenthal for comments from the US perspective. David, I think you're muted. Okay. Yeah, I, I thought that uh, I would be unmuted by the, okay. the divine forces of this webinar, but I guess I had to do it myself. Um, thanks, Jennifer, for those insights. And thanks to the investigators, uh, Jose and Irene, for their enormous work uh, we were very pleased to co-sponsor this work, the Commonwealth Fund, with the Health Foundation. It is really unique in the extent to which it has gotten under the hood to look at the, uh, the individual uh, effects of differing care in different uh, countries. And I think we'll provide a reservoir of insights for many years to come and uh, a stimulus for future research. Uh, in coming from the United States, it just becomes so clear that the late professor Muva Reinhardt, a very prominent economist in the United States, had it right when he titled his last book, Priced Out. Uh, the United States has a illness in its healthcare system. Uh, that illness is uh, uncontrolled and in out outrageous prices perhaps best illustrated with drug prices. Notice that we have fewer drugs and we spend much more to have them uh, in the course of the care of this two groups of, of, of patients. And we know that and we try to remedy it. And right now before the United States Congress, we are watching the power of the pharmaceutical industry gradually wear down efforts to do something about that pricing problem. And that is a microcosm of the pricing problem that exists throughout our healthcare system in which the lack of any centralized power, either private or public, leaves the delivery system, which is supposedly a market, leaves that market without any price controls except those that uh, local negotiators can exert. And we pay more and we use the same amount. Um, in a way, the, the England is at least has the benefit of knowing that there's a possibility that if it's spent more on care, it might make that care better. Spending more is not the problem in the United States. It's how we spend it that is the problem. I am struck by the lessons that might be gleaned from the comparative use of inpatient as opposed to post 
uh, inpatient care in the United States, particularly rehab care. We use less hospital care because hospitals are expensive. And we thought that by putting DRGs in place about 20 years ago, 30 years ago now, that we might reduce the use of hospital stay and thereby reduce costs. The system was much smarter than policymakers. Uh, it created a new industry called rehab. Uh, and now we spend enormous amounts of money on rehab, less on hospitals, not less on hospitals, but utilize less care. We still charge an enormous amount, so we spend more. Um, but we've, we've created a new uh, industry uh, that is probably also overutilized. And we have lower in-hospital mortality because we put so much emphasis on getting patients out of the hospital in the name of economy. And the result is people die elsewhere. Uh, and so we, it looks like we have better and may actually die at higher rates than they otherwise would have. So I think this data forces us to look again at what may have been a very short-sighted policy of emphasizing out-of-hospital care, perhaps to the detriment of the overall welfare of uh, sick uh, and frail patients. Uh, we do have to find out what the causes of these mortality differences are. Uh, Jennifer has has raised a couple of possibilities. Uh, we know it's not from the amount of care provided. It may have something to do with the location of care provided. Uh, it may have to do in the United States with the lack of integrated care from primary care physicians, because clearly we disproportionately use specialty care in the United States compared to comparator countries. We've known that whether it is responsible for re less, uh, less uh, fortunate outcomes remains to be uh, more clearly elucidated. The lack of any long-term care system in the United States is a big problem. Uh, there is legislation pending now before the Congress, which would greatly increase spending for home and community-based services. Uh, it is promising to think about that as a alternative to inpatient or uh, long-term care or no long-term care at all. But we will have to study that if it comes to being, study whether that has actually made, system, made things better. There are some interesting models that were created under the Affordable Care Act of providing more intensive home care that have improved outcomes and reduced costs. So that's a, a, a silver lining. So again, I, I will just stop my prepared comments by Congratulating the team again. This is the kind of work we need to do more of. Uh, we were hopeful when we began this work, uh, piloting it uh, almost a decade ago, that it would reveal this kind of uh, these kinds of insights. And I'm looking forward to having more such work at the personal level as well as the national level going forward. Well, thanks to both of you for those terrific comments. Um, I'm going to pose a series of questions to both of you or one each back and forth, um, but I'll start with a question to both of you, which is a sort of broader question, which is how useful are these types of international comparisons for policymakers and for clinical leaders? I know both of your organizations have been involved in this. I'm more familiar with the Commonwealth Fund, which has been producing these significant and forgive me, jaw-dropping international comparisons for about 20 years now, just came out with your sixth last August. Um, do people pay attention to these? Do you feel like they make any difference or is it like, oh, that's interesting and it gets pushed to the side in terms of what you've been able to observe from your deep involvement in these kinds of what I find to be incredibly compelling analyses? And I'll start with David perhaps. Well, thanks for those kind words about our, our uh, cross-national comparisons. They're called our mirror of mirror reports. We just produced a, a 2021 mirror mirror report. It showed, as all the others have done, that the United States is such a poor performer compared to the 10 other comparator high-income countries that really it doesn't belong in the same report. We should be comparing the United States to low and middle-income countries in terms of health system performance, not to other high income countries. Uh, we spend so much more and get such, uh, so much less satisfying results. Uh, and this study perhaps 
it doesn't really point to why, but it confirms that perspective. Our reports, uh, the, our mirror mirror report, just the last one, it got 60,000 views the day it was released and 130,000 within two months. It is by far the most widely consumed product of the Commonwealth Fund. Uh, it is widely used in places like the Chan School uh, and other places where health policymakers are taught and formed. I think it forms a very important benchmarking tool and source of tension because it is very hard for any informed student of the healthcare system to sustain the false argument that the United States has the best healthcare system in the world. You still hear that, especially from conservatives. But I think our, our work, I'd like to think, is essential to making important change to the extent that we can in the United States. So yes, I think, it, I think it's valuable or we wouldn't continue to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Dixon, what's, what's, is, is it different in the UK and uh, in England in terms of these studies? And what's been your history and experience in terms of the impact of these? No, I think they are impactful. I mean, there are obviously moments where studies such as this are collected and there's a moment and sometimes that moment is in the press around the time of an election where the NHS is usually top of the news when it comes to the election manifestos and government um, and opposition debates. Um, so I've seen that definitely influence thinking. Um, and sometimes also when the NHS itself has a sort of national strategic moment, a few years ago it developed the, the NHS five-year forward view, which is a sort of runway of strategy for it for the next five and then the long-term plan and again at that point these sorts of studies are used to shape priorities whether they are priorities for generic things um, or like infrastructure or whether they're priorities for particular disease areas so I would say that um, that there are moments where they, they are particularly valuable but as one-offs they're also quite valuable particularly if they gain press attention so I would say that they have an iterative and then impact, but also they have a collective impact at certain moments. And I've certainly been directly witness to how those um, priorities get rewritten as a result of studies such as these. Okay, thank you both. So I'm gonna ask then some questions of each of you and I'll, I'll start with Dr. Dixon again, if that's okay, if I hit you with uh, two in a row. So. Um, one of the things that we learned from this that I think is probably a little surprising to folks in the United States is that um, England doesn't particularly have a strong universal access to social care and to settings outside of the acute hospital. Um, and do you think this is um, connected to the poor outcomes? And does it have implications in terms of uh, the length of stay, hospital expenditures, uh, things like that. I know you touched on this in your remarks, but I'd like to dig a little bit more deeply into that, if that's okay. Thank you. So the NHS provides universal free at the point of use cover for hospital, primary care, community services in the community. Um, for example, primary outpatient, um, but it does not provide universal free cover for social care as it's described, which is means tested and far less available and accessible to ordinary people, I would say. Um, so, so, that, so the NHS does provide free universal cover for a lot of these things outside of hospital. Um, however, we do know from expenditure trends over the last 20, 30 years that the lion's share of growth in spending in the healthcare system has gone to the hospitals and not to primary care or community services that have been the poor relation and indeed mental health until recently. So we do know that um, there is sort of has been relative impoverishment, if I can put it that way, or low growth in those areas, which has not really kept up with demand. Uh, and in a service as resource constrained as the NHS is, I mean, you just have to look at the health expenditure per capita in the recent OECD analyses to show how parsimonious we are in the NHS compared to other health systems in this study. 
Um, um, even then the squeeze has been on this out of hospital care. And I think that could be uh, a reason why we're contributing to the mortality rates we're seeing, particularly at a year. It could also be why hospitals are hanging on to patients because they can't easily discharge them with confidence if they feel that the out of hospital services are, are, um, are, are inadequate, particularly for social care. And I think that's a real problem where we have got, you know, we're almost teetering on the brink of catastrophe in the social care system at the moment. So I do think um, I do think this is a very interesting area for further probing. Um, and I, I think if Iconic went anywhere, I think it, in Britain, it should be looking at this out of hospital care in more detail and the link with social care. Um, so that is where I think we should be focusing more. The other the other thing about the England, just again, looking at OECD data is that our staffing levels are much lower. Um, in particular, that in physiotherapy, for example, which you'd expect to be highly used with hip, uh, hip um, fracture patients, um, we really do have an eye-watering low rate of those staff compared to other countries. So this may also be a reason why, both in hospital and outside of hospital, some of our um, care may be uh, contributing to the mortality rates. Okay, thank you very much for that. It's very helpful. Um, turning to uh, to Dr. Blumenthal. So one of the interesting comparisons, of course, between England and the US is the uh, robust post-acute system in the United States without a parallel over in England. But then at the same time, as you noted, the United States lacks any long-term care system to provide support for people who are above the poverty level and don't end up qualifying for Medicaid uh, they can attempt to get long-term care insurance on the private market, although that is a highly unstable market. Um, should the United States think about some broader national approach to covering and paying for long-term care? Do you see any signs of hope on the horizon that we're ready for that? There was an effort to try to get at that in the Affordable Care Act called the CLASS Act, the Community Living Assistance Services and Supports, which was repealed before it even got started in 2013. Um, where, where do you see this, this, this dialogue, this process in the United States? Are we making any headway um, or are we, are we stuck in neutral on this, do you think? Well, the need is clear. Uh, we do, as you were suggesting, have a pro, a, pro, a program that covers poor people for long-term care. Our Medicaid program, once you spend down, spend your income down to a poverty level, you become eligible for Medicaid and Medicaid will cover long-term care services, not generously. Uh, and the, there's a question of the quality of those services because of the low payment rates. Medicare will cover post-hospital long-term care for a period of time, as long, it, interestingly, as only as long as you're improving. Once you stop improving, then they toss you out. So at the point where you need the help the most, Medicare withdraws its coverage. There is hope, I think, for more generous home and community-based services. There's several hundred billion dollars in the pending uh, reconciliation bill, Build Back Better bill, whatever it's called at this point in time, uh, that is now under negotiation. Uh, and we have a couple of senators uh, who are providing, proving the pivotal point of agreement for this and whether it will emerge or not depends on what side of the bed they happen to get up on on the day the vote occurs, I think. But uh, that is not a long-term solution. There is no market for long-term care services. It doesn't work. The people who buy the insurance are the people who need the care, and pretty soon they get priced out by high premiums. Uh, and uh, anyone who's th sought such insurance has quickly found that it's a really uneconomical thing to purchase. And often, because of increasing costs, the insurance companies renege on their obligations because the, premium, the premiums that have been paid aren't enough to cover the costs as they are actually incurred. 
So as long if this is a need, and given the aging of our population, along with those of every high income country, it certainly is a need, we will have to find a way for government to do this. Now, in the United States, there is a well-developed allergy to government. Uh, and that allergy shows, shows no sign of abating. It is moderated very slightly in the post-pandemic period. But as the current debate shows, there is no, in this deeply divided country, there is no uniform consensus that government should have a larger role in healthcare, either in coverage or in uh, access to long-term care. So I, I'm not terribly optimistic. Uh, we're talking about lots and lots of money. We're talking about a government that is, um, of which Americans have deep suspicions. And so just to probe just a little bit more deeply on that, David, one of, one of the lessons a lot of people drew from the failure of the Class Act in the Affordable Care Act was that a voluntary system is just not viable to do it. And if you really want to create a system, it has to be kind of an all-in system with some kind of universal financing. That was not politically possible in the ACA because it was already one mandate for individuals that was already the most politically hot piece. Do you accept that analysis? Is that one of the reasons why it's so difficult for the nation to move forward? Because if you go down the road of voluntary, you just get to a dead end. Yeah. That's the, the reason why the private market doesn't fit, doesn't work, because the private market is essentially voluntary. And the only people who buy insurance are the people who need it. And that is a recipe for failure in a uh, industry that depends on the sharing of risk between low risk and high risk individuals. And the same is true in a government program. If your government runs a voluntary program, its costs will be unsustainable. And those costs were to be borne in part by the individuals who needed the services. So this has to be a program that's analogous to our Medicare program. And our Medicare program is supported through mandatory taxes that are part of the social security system collected uh, as though they were social security taxes. Every employed American pays a Medicare tax. And in fact, it is a system through which young people, working people support the healthcare needs of older people. It's an intergenerational transfer, but it works politically because young people know older people. They have grandparents, they have parents, and they can see with their own eyes what they will need when they get to be that age. And so it's sustainable. Now, whether we can do that for long-term care, I just frankly have my doubts because of the enormous expenditures involved and the threats to Medicare for acute care services, which are already substantial from a solvency standpoint. Okay, thank you. So turning it back to, uh, to Dr. Dixon. So one of the striking results for England are the um, high mortality rates for uh, persons at all time frames? Um, were you surprised by that? Do you have any um, interpretation or explanation for what you think is the uh, significant driver for these higher mortality rates? Yeah, thank you, John. Just just quickly before I get to that, just to just respond to David and the. Uh, we're probably defining social, we say social care, you, you, what your long term care may be something similar, I'm not quite sure. But just to say we've had very significant debates in this country about how to pay for social care. And actually the government, Boris Johnson's very famously stood on the steps of Downing Street and when he was elected leader 2019 to say that he promised to fix social care once and for all so older people wouldn't have to sell their houses to pay for social care and actually they've just announced that that the government is going to institute a cap so that the government will pay uh, above a certain level for catastrophic costs more than eighty thousand pounds for across a lifetime uh, and below that to try and encourage then obviously some kind of insurance market to come in or indeed for people to be protected against those the catastrophic costs but pay out of pocket so it's probably worth watching how that will be instituted 
Um, and it's uh, again paid by a health and social care levy, as it's called, on the working age population, um, which is not going down quite so uh, positively because of the intergenerational transfer, just as you say. So anyway, it's worth watching for those who are seasoned policy wonks uh, listening. Um, on the high mortality rates, was, were they surprising? Well, I, I think because we have our own internal audits inside Britain, they weren't surprising for the congestive heart failure or the uh, hip fracture patients, um, both at 30 days and one year. Um, I think what is, so, is surprising is the relativity compared to the other countries that we, we, we compared with. Um, and for that reason, it, we really do need to have further and serious analysis of this. In fact, I've sent this study already, the findings to the medical director of NHS England, who I'm hoping will want to then follow up with a meeting with us to, to discuss. But um, again, it's, it's the reasons why for the 30 day in hospital, but also for the out of hospital, it, that I think one can only moot at at the moment because the data outside of hospital is murky and in hospital we just don't know enough about what's happening. I do come back to the fact, as I say on the hip side, that we don't do as many hip replacements. The volumes of surgery done are actually quite low relative internationally, so maybe that is a feature. Um, infections, DVTs, you know, the kinds of complications don't seem to be higher um, from what I can see. But what we do know is the staffing levels are lower compared to other countries. So I'd be worried about the, um, the proactive nature of rehabilitation after surgery. That's what I would point to and whether some of these older patients are actually getting deconditioned in the hospital for longer, which means that their longer term outcomes are poorer. Uh, out of hospital, I would look at the, just the general level of care um, because of the the less the lower investment in those services. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, David, um, a surprising finding that I, I've been in health policy for about 37 years now, and every day I learned something new. And one of the big surprises for me in this study that I didn't know is the United States of the 11 countries is only one of two countries, including further surprise Canada, where outpatient services are mostly done by specialists rather than primary care doctors. Were you surprised by that? Um, why is that the case? And does that finding have any implications in terms of the larger dynamics of the results and what we're seeing here? Yeah. Actually, John, that didn't surprise me. I'm a primary care physician by training. Uh, and so I track issues of primary care. And the since I was training, uh, and it's been more than 37 years since that happened. Uh, I have been aware of the relatively low prestige and, and compensation that primary care commands in the United States. This is a structured into the payment system in the United States. And it's also imbued in the training of physicians that primary care is viewed as a less attractive, credible, prestigious field I would say that primary care in the United States is vestigial. It is unavailable in many places. I happen to live in the Boston metropolitan area. The single biggest request I get from my friends in this area is please find me a primary care physician. Uh, I can find them cardiologists and gastroenterologists and neurosurgeons galore, but primary care physicians are few and their practices are all closed or they've gone into something called concierge practice, which means that if you pay them $10,000 a year, uh, they'll admit you to their practice. That's above and beyond what they get paid for seeing you for the services um, that you receive. And they can do that because the market will support it. Um, so we are great at turning out specialists in the United States. Uh, we have great specialty services. Uh, we are second to none in the world in the quality and amount of our specialty services. Uh, we, but we have totally inadequate primary care and it's getting worse in a very peculiar way. And I don't know whether other countries are having this phenomenon, but we are seeing the explosion of primary care substitutes 
in the form of urgent care centers um, and wait um, uh, prime physician assistants located in drugstores and supermarkets uh, to the extent that we are fragmenting what exists of our primary care into these multiple alternative sites that are not linked directly to the rest of the healthcare system. So uh, it is the result of the market responding to the lack of primary care. It might be that if we wanted those patients to see primary care physicians more, it wouldn't work because they don't exist. So just have to ask Dr. Dixon, um, we've been engaged in national hand wringing for about 40 years or more about the state of primary care in the United States. Um, and do you have those pressures? Are you feeling the same things in England or is it just on a totally different wavelength? It's, it's, it is on a different wavelength. I mean, primary care was thought to be the jewel in the crown of the National Health Service. Um, 300, we have a population in England of 55 million people and we have just over 300 million consultations with general practitioners every year. So it's the big front window of the National Health Service, if you like. Uh, and it's much loved and general practice is always top of the pops on long term patient surveys of how satisfied people are with the National Health Service. Um, on the other hand, as I said earlier, over the last 20, 30 years, the lion's share of growth has gone into hospitals and away from primary care. And so over time, we've had increasing shortages of general practice. Um, and a, a, a sort of beginning to move to think about what could be substituting general practice, not quite the kinds of private providers, the fragmented private that you're describing, David, but more digital first and online services that could be the first port of call. And that has all accelerated during the pandemic, where, of course, in our country, the, the number of uh, consultations reduced by about 70% at least, and face-to-face uh, -face, that is, uh, in favor of telephone consultations. And as we now recover, there's a huge debate in Britain um, by, by in a sense, the, the GPs who are keeping um, quite a lot of telephonic services um, and um, the public who are very cross because they want normal service to be resumed but the shortages mean that that just is unlikely to be resumed. So some people are saying, are we seeing the long-term decline now of general practice or are we seeing the slow rebirth of general practice to be pulled into a digital age? So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, the stresses and strains are slightly different, but the, the shortages, investment, uh, not so much fragmentation, but really what is the vision for primary care in the new digital age is something that is really becoming quite acute and we need to solve to, uh, we need to solve soon and we also need to manage public expectations for the future given the volume of people seeing general practice and at the moment we're just getting a very disgruntled mass of people and very sort of bewildered gps who have given their all in the pandemic and find that the public they're facing public aggro for the first time in decades. So it's a very interesting mix. So I suspect we'll have a lot of visionary documents coming out in Britain soon on the future of general practice and primary care. Just amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, the, the nuances, the constant shifting and changing of every system, and in this case, the US system and the English system is just uh, extraordinary to behold. And thank you all for your incredible efforts to continue to improve it and maintain it. Thanks to uh, Jennifer Dixon from the Health Foundation. Thanks to David Blumenthal from the Commonwealth Fund. And particular thanks and kudos to uh, Drs. Jose Figueroa and Irene Papanicolas for their outstanding and provocative study that I hope will get wide attention, particularly with the engagement of the audience, the great large audience that's here today to see this. So thanks to everybody. Thanks to Iconic for sponsoring this. And thanks to all of you for coming and spending this time with us today. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you.